hosted in uh, Grab Taxi. And uh, so our program today is um, we're going to have Kari from Grab Taxi over there. Kari. Yeah. Hello. Right. And then uh, so we're going to talk about um, Go in the context of Grab Taxi. And then we have Valentin, uh, which I think he. Oh, okay. Um, so, and then he'll talk about uh, his experience trying to go uh, with a coding challenge that um, was, on, was online. So, without further ado, then, Kari. So, uh, thank you. Thank you both for coming and for letting me speak to you. Uh, I'd also like to say uh, I'm quite impressed with the number of people. I think the last Go meet up I saw in Malaysia was about six people and it was really kind of sad. Um, suffice to say there wasn't a second one that I saw. So on the other hand you guys look quite strong and, and people seem quite keen which to me is, is very very exciting because I mean personally I'm very excited about Go and then, uh, I've, it's my new favorite language I'm sure that'll change at some point but for the moment it's true. Um, I guess I should say also that um, when I was first suggested to, to talk to you today, I was asked, as you mentioned, to talk about how we were using Go in Grab Taxi. What uh, was and, your past favorite language? Sorry for interrupting. Um, I guess I'll probably have to say Java. Oh, Please don't think less of me for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, strangely, I think whatever I'm doing at the time ends up being my favorite language. <laughs> Because there was a time when I absolutely hated Java, so it's really getting off topic. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I was supposed to speak to you about how we're using a Go in Grab Taxi, and and while I'm happy to do that, it, it felt a bit self-serving. Um, if you want to know about that, by all means, grab me afterwards, or, or grab one of the other the Grab Taxi gophers around. We'd be more than happy to share with you. Um, that said, I thought it might be more interesting if I share with you some code uh, and uh, a couple of, well, at least one neat trick that we use uh, that we're very happy about and, and hopefully it's uh, as useful to you as it is to us. So to dive into it, uh, the trick here is dependency injection. Uh, in actual fact, dependency injection in, in terms of testing uh, and before you get all like, that's got to be a crazy boring topic, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, if nothing else, bear with me a little bit and see if it helps. Okay, so to give you a little bit of context, assume we have a function, pretty standard function, that pulls a list of passengers from the database. Right? Pretty straightforward, it's just going to hit the database, it's going to perform some kind of query, then it's going to take the, the rows object and convert it back into structs. Right? I'm sure you've all written this kind of code many times over. Right? Question then is, how do you test such a function? So short answer, it's easy to test the happy path, as in the correct operations. The downside though is, you have to actually insert the data into the MySQL, or whatever database is your preference, right? For those that have done a bit of that, will immediately go, hang on, that's crazy. Not only is it going to be slow because you're worrying about external resource, aka the database, but it's also going to break. As soon as there's any data in the database other than this, that's it. Test is done. It's broken, useless. Right? The tradition, on the other hand, if you want to test the errors, <coughs> you just can't do it. Unless you find some funky way of like turning off the database or having it return errors, and that's just a rabbit hole you just don't want to get into. Right? Traditional solution to this is where we started, dependency injection. Injecting the database resource so, you, so that you can then mock it out or replace it with something else. Right? Now if we dig down into that, it might then change the function signature to look something like this. Pass in the database object, but otherwise everything else is the same. You're still hitting the database, you're still converting the results. Where that gets us is the ability to do this. A happy path test has blown out. It's really quite big. But it does allow you to test in very fine detail. Now, I'm actually using a tool here called SQL Mock. If you Google for that, it should show up as probably the first result. Go SQL Mock. 
Actually, this tool, we, we do use it, um, and I, I actually recommend it. However, I recommend it with a provisor. You don't want to use it too often, because as you can see, it's a lot of code. More code means more to maintain, means more of everything, basically. Right? So if you really do need to test the database, by all means, use a tool like this, and approach like this will totally work. What is also given us, now we can actually test the errors. We can test no data, we can test connection down, we can test all kinds of other error conditions. So we could feel more confident in our function and that our function is going to gracefully, gracefully handle errors. Okay? However, okay, there is a better way, which hopefully I'll sell you in a minute. Right? Just to quickly sort of summarize the quote unquote traditional, normally you're going to pass in the resource or dependency inject the resource. A lot of the time, the thing that you pass in will be an interface. Uh, in, in, in good Go style, you'll be trying to pass in the minimum interface you can. In this case, there is no interface. The database is a struct, not an interface, and it's not a small one. So then becomes the downside of this kind of approach is that then becomes expensive to maintain. You can, as I said, use mock objects. And as a result of mock objects, then you've got all the, the mock generator tools, which will help reduce that burden. But it still ends up to be a lot of code. Right? So, last point there, I, I, in fact, the, the one I skipped over, which is one that took me, basically I had to get out of Java to learn the last question, the last point, which was the, the knowledge sh shared between the caller and the callee is, is quite great. As in, if you want to test this function that we had, the caller or the outside, it could be an external package, has to know that you're using a database, has to know what the configuration of that database is, and how to create it and pass it in. And in the Java world, we had all kinds of tools for auto-wiring this stuff and annotations and all kinds of clever stuff. Go, we don't have that. And in a way, I guess I'm kind of hoping we never had that. Um, while I do miss my annotations, all the other heavyweight stuff and the the 30 second startup and the long compile cycles and all the other features of Java, I'd rather do without. Right? So, going back forward. So, just, just to prove my point about how expensive it is to maintain this mock object, this is the database object you'd have to pass in. Now, if you're writing this by hand, that's a 10 functions, even with stubbed implementations, that's hundred lines of code, more. You do that, how often do you have to do that before it becomes like, I don't want to do this, I'm just going to skip that test and hide it. Right? Thankfully we found a better way. So if you consider the function I had before was private, if we then make it a public function, then the, the issue I mentioned before about knowledge leaking out from the package to the caller, and the cost of that becomes much more apparent. In the, the approach I'm trying to show you here, the resultant code would look something like the first one. In the traditional direct de dependency injection approach, it looks much like the second one. Now, I'm hoping you're all with me in liking the first one for the lack of like complexity. But, I mean, each to their own, right? We can argue about that after. <laughs> so, if I dig down into that, this is, I, I've skipped out some code. How I can then, um, okay, so, sorry, let me just say. Then the question becomes, how can I test the function that calls this function without actually interacting with the database? Right? If I have a function that depends on this list function, instinctually I need to have data in the database, otherwise that test isn't going to work. This is where the trick comes in, and when my realization when I moved from Java, which obviously doesn't have 
functions as variables or as first class citizens. This was a mind blown kind of moment. In production, this code will run as if that second thing here, you give me our rule, this bar list passengers 04, in production, that looks like a function. It doesn't look like a variable. Now, as far as the rest of the code path goes, it's a function. But because it's a variable of type function, we can replace it. We can replace it in production if we wish, but in this use case, we can replace it in testing. So I can completely obliterate the need for the database by replacing that function with another function that returns whatever data I like. Let me show you that. So, okay, hang on. Yes, okay, so forgive me, it's a little bit, uh, this one's a little bit complicated, and I'm hoping that once you see the trick, once the complexity drops away, but for the moment, if you have a look at the middle section where it says mock calls to the data package, that is how I'm replacing that function I had with another function which returns what I wanted to return. Right? What I, what I should have mentioned earlier is, so something here. It's going to feel a little weird at first. What I've done is the, the var list passengers 04 is actually just a wrapper around the call to the other package. Right? And this is intentional. It seems like duplication. I'm sorry, it is. But it's intentional duplication so that I can keep the scope of the knowledge inside this package. Or if you like, I can keep the scope of the damage inside this package. Right? There is actually no damage, but if you're a, a bit of a, a OCD like I am with my code quality, it, it starts to feel like damage. Right? So back to this. The first part that we skipped over, defer funk. It looks disgusting. Actually, all I'm doing is setting using defer to replace the function that I overwrote. So that when this test is done, the function goes back to what it was before it started. But this test actually has no knowledge of how that function is implemented. So I'm not replacing it with a new function. I'm using defer's, in my opinion, quite fantastic feature that this, uh, let's say line four, where it says, curly bracket list passenger 04 is evaluated when it's executed rather than when the defer fires to copy that function so that when that defer actually runs, I've got the old function in that memory, if you will. Now, you can further make this uh, whole defer mock thing a lot less disgusting by having functions which so you can just say defer function, and the function we often write is restore function x. That at least drops off those first three lines and makes them one. It makes me feel a little cleaner, not so dirty. Um, but you cannot uh, skip over the middle part because that's the important part. If I was to show you this one, for example, this is how I would test the database error of no rows. So. Same defer to restore, different mock implementation of that function. <coughs> and I hope you see that you have sort of unlimited power there. You can make it panic, you can make it return anything you like. And it's all self-contained in the test, so the test is collected and sort of easy to understand. You're not pulling logic from all over the place. And perhaps if you're a TDD purist, you're not pulling from external resources, so you don't have that cost. Good question. Yep. But how do you um, say, like, you know, during all this development, um, some of the stuff in the database also changed, uh, and now here, because you're using code to mark the database, mm -hmm. then what happened could be there's some discrepancy between your code, your code would pass, mm -hmm. but actually it won't run in production because the database already changed. Uh, okay, so. Uh, 
Yes, good. Thank you for reminding me of that. So, uh, I, I believe your question is, what happens if the data in the database, or I'm guessing the data structure, yeah. changes this and therefore breaks change. production but not the test? Right. Um, in this case, I would defer it in the sense that in this case, this test won't help you. I would hope you would have tests in the called package, which would do the verification. So. Uh, and that, you, would, that would call out this guy and say this guy didn't pass? Uh, no, I think for my mind, I would have the SQL mock that I mentioned in the traditional section. Yeah. I would have it actually responding as a database, which in fact now that's the the probably the makes no difference. Yeah, because the schema um, changer might not know the. You're absolutely right. We, the only way we kind of account for that is to have more. UAT or end-to-end -end type tests, okay. yeah, uh, yeah, smoke yeah. tests, if you will. Um, those are expensive and they kind of break a lot of the, the rules. Um, but I find them valuable, at least for that kind of stuff. Just sanity check. The, but I can tell you, we, we've made that mistake a couple of times. <laughs> it happens. Uh, there, there are ways to deal with it, but the problem you've got there is um, <coughs> You have to uh, make sure the database, that you don't write too many tests against the database because then the, <coughs> the size of the data in the database itself drags the performance down. Um, but you also want to have enough to know that it's it's sane. Um, otherwise, you deploy to production and the whole world comes crashing down. Go balance it. In fact, in, I use test skip a lot for those kind of tests. So, my day-to-day, -day, like uh, IntelliJ or, or command line run, it does automatically skips all the database required tests. But I do run that in the build server. I see. Thank you. No problem. Why oh. did you use a function approach rather than defining a method? You could define a type and then a type of a method, then the interfaces would take care of itself. Uh, in this particular example, I'm not sure you, I mean, you could. Um, Maybe I was trying to break away from writing Java code in Go, which I've been accused of doing. Um, and I have done. I, I will openly admit it. This feels more Go-esque. That certainly sounds like it would work too. Yeah, this, this is a very functional programming approach. Yeah, and if I was a Node guy before, maybe I would. you could blame it on that. But for the moment, it's just a neat trick. I, mm. I, I won't say there's that much thinking. Can we to the previous question, what was the problem? Uh, database code breaking or the data structure that's written so, that so, changes? Uh, when you iterate pretty quickly, you often will change the schema and like you change uh, the code schema, but the database. So the, the, the data structure that comes back, uh, you expect it to change it, but you didn't update your test. Yeah, it, it's similar to when you change the structure in your dev box and the tests work, but you forget to do it in production during the deploy cycle or before. It's the same kind of error. Yeah. Uh, you just have to do enough to make yourself happy, happy about it. So just write the database test, make sure the schema matches up. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I'm a big fan of smoke tests if I can pull them off, but I, I only want a very small number because they do write dirty data in the database and, and there's all kinds of other expenses. Okay, so um, to sum up on that side of things, uh, I would say, look, there's no, a big plus one for me, there's no impact on normal operations. I'm not, it's not test-induced damage for, for those that listen to the DHH and, and some of those guys. Um, it's much simpler, for my mind at least, than just a straight up mocking. Um, it's, it feels to me like it decouples my packages and my, my layers uh, a lot cleaner, uh, and that I would reiterate that point of having the function call a wrapper function and then through. Um, that sort of it keeps that decision in the in the calling layer, and so the the underlying external resource, be it database or REST or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be aware of what you're doing or not. Um, on the downside. The restore function is kind of disgusting. It looks bad. Like I said, you can pay that cost down by making a function that you know that adds some cost. It's not for free. Uh, and, and perhaps the, the worst one we've come across is concurrency. 
when you run go test, it doesn't seem to run it concurrently. Now, maybe I'm, I'm missing a flag to, to pull that off, but any attempt that we've done to make them concurrent has highlighted this problem. Uh, and one of our engineers, who's probably hiding in the back over there, actually found that there was a way around that. <coughs> um, I think for me, for my mind, there was two, two parts to that problem. Most of the time, you're going to mock out inside the package in a consistent manner. So again, if you're using that local mock, um, the, it is less of a problem. But if you're using a function that has input parameters, and in our case, we were testing a lot of booking-related stuff, we can actually make this uh, mock function just that little bit smarter. So it said, if the booking code is this, <laughs> return the mock. If it's anything else, just return the old function. And effectively put a bit more smarts in there to make concurrency more of a thing. Um, in actual fact, I hope I haven't sped through, but there was kind of a reason why I sped through. Firstly, I'd say thank you. Is there any other questions on this? Otherwise, if I have time, I have one other trick I'd really like to share. How are we doing? Yeah, All right. Any questions before we? Um, so I mean, just touch up. Uh, so since you are doing uh, dependency, dependency injection, right? Yep. You, so you you already mentioned that uh, say you, you run it concurrently, other people can modify your export function. Right? So um, so um, do you think it's a pretty good enough issue or? What, what you guys are doing now, that you end up with the PI rather than just a traditional uh, This is a relatively, well, not a relatively new trick, but it's not one we've used everywhere. The concurrency issue took a long time for us to surface. It was only when we were, our build server was taking longer than we were patient enough to wait for that we tried to run them concurrently. Uh, if we hadn't done that, we, I wouldn't have even mentioned it because I wouldn't have noticed. Um, I'm, while I find the solution that w the, the, the gentleman wrote very clever, I kind of don't like it because it, it still feels not very robust. Um, at this point, I, I just want to sort of say your, mile, your mileage may vary. I know that's a cop out, and I'm sorry for that. Um, but I would say, like, we do use this trick quite a bit, and I haven't really noticed it that bad. Because you still got the risk of somebody else uh, in production time injecting something. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was going to make a joke, but the more serious answer is I, I trust <coughs> the guys I work with. Um, I don't... Uh, you <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I guess I, I've been there like trying to be paranoid against protecting myself against myself. Or oh, myself against the idiots I work with, but eventually I'm like, actually, they're not idiots. Perhaps I should just trust them and myself. Or if I hurt myself, it's my own damn fault. So, you know, I, I think that's a, a, a non requirement. I think the problem with concurrent testing is because uh, your function variable is a variable, and concurrency requires we only. Yeah, absolutely right. I think, I mean, in a TDD purist sense, they will say your test must be concurrent. Like that's one of the commandments. Um, I never really. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of those gentlemen, and like, but I don't take everything they say to be gospel. Um, like I said, if my tests weren't fast, weren't slowing down, I wouldn't have even. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Actually, not means the test must be concurrent. It must be independent. Yes, yeah, absolutely right. I think it's a, what's the, an acronym is like fit, fitness or something? FUS. Yeah, so, and one of them is independent and idempotent and, and like, it's all kind of like... Irrelevant of sequence and all those things. Yeah, and I try to follow the rules as much as I can, but sometimes I just like, screw the rules. It's, <laughs> it's gonna cost me too much, I, I'll pay the price later. Ding. <laughs> As you can tell, he works for me. He's happy I'm saying that. <laughs> Screw the rules. <laughs> so, I, I still have time, right? So, next trick. No. Um, so, I'm assuming everyone's written any kind of Go. And I know myself, I've written a lot of this. The code looks like that. 
and, and by that I mean a whole lot of if else if error equals not null, right? This is Go style. Yes. What if I told you you can write Go like that? I can't tell if it's stunned silence or... What's time <laughs> I mean, it's irrelevant. The, the point is, I'm, I'm still having... These functions could still return errors or could still generate an error, right? But I don't have all that boilerplate. Are you using nil as an error value? No. And, and uh, are you using something resembling uh, option of time? Mm, no. Between you doing decorators? No. Nope. So, like, uh, I, 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 I might, but I, I'm not sure. I've never actually done any part of You basically wrap you know, these things around with something, and it's a common code. Uh, I think that's, that's similar to option from Scala, right? Is, that's, where you, that's probably where Scala stole it from, I guess. The short answer is no. I, 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 I missed out the key important cool. point so here. You do a catch, like, at the end? He's basically Pretty much that. Um, so I, this was inspired by the, the clean code book from Bob Martin, if anybody knows who that is. And obviously that's a Java book, but the same thing seems to apply here. If I zoom out from this, what you can do in your sub functions is instead of having them return an error, you have them panic. And the input of that panic be the error that you want to return. Right? Now, it doesn't look so great here because I'd probably not save any lines. But when the function starts to get quite long, or you do some cleverness, or you don't do quite so much with the recover part, the benefits of readability and nothing else are fantastic. Or if you're anything like me, I kind of, the recover seems to disappear. I don't see it. I write it, and then it disappears. All I see is the business logic part, which to me is like, I'm sorry, a lot sexier. Can you, can you function dependent uh, like error um, errors here? Sorry. So for example, like you got you know, two or three functions here. Yep. Uh, which one then like, could have like different uh, error messages, right? Like you know, by this method, can the error messages like you can inject that error messages like at the calling the function? Okay, yes. So uh, let me paraphrase. I, I think your question is: Will the errors in the sub functions still be? obvious to the return, does that? Does yeah, it, does just it what you yes. Okay, so with that as the question, um, yes, absolutely, and I think in this case that disgusting looking recover at the top, actually what it's doing is saying if the error is a runtime error, as in an actual panic, just re-panic. Right? You don't actually have to do that, and, and in a lot of my code it doesn't actually re-panic, I just catch it, because in a lot of cases I want to catch not only my errors, but any random panics that I've somehow missed. Um, whereas the second part, the cast, the result of the cast, or when, when the cast is successful, I'm actually grabbing back the error, which was the value of the panic, and returning that to the function. So the net result to my public consumers is actually identical. All I've done is change the code around to hopefully look better. I'm a bit lost. Is recover a built-in function or a function you wrote? Uh, no, a recover is a built-in function. Uh -huh. So um, I'm not familiar with that. Part. Assuming I, I, I don't explain it very well, uh, there's a Go blog article called Panic Defer Recover, Panic Defer recover. which tries to explain this. Uh, if, if, if this uh, example feels a little contrived, obviously it is, but there are a couple of real life usages you can look at. Um, the marshalling JSON function actually uses this to unravel the recursion. So a as you can guess, JSON parsing is recursive. Uh, instead of return, 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 ret they just panic. And it just says, screw all that, jump to the top. So the logic is a little bit cleaner. Um, uh, beyond that, um, it's. I think it's also used in Go lint or Go imports. One of. I have to get back to that. It is actual Go code I was I was referencing uh, surprisingly. Um, oh, so key points here. I, I should and I have notes here so that I remember. Um, 
following the go recommendations, rules if you like, you should never let your panic outside your package. Right? You, you could totally just make it panic and not catch it. But that's not very friendly. Right? You've just crashed whoever's calling you. The whole point of the panic here is not to actually panic, but to just clean up the code. So you, by catching the error and rethrowing it, as far as anyone knows, you've written the whole error equals not known. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't care. They get a nicely formatted error and, and the exact same error that they would otherwise get. Um, it unravels recursion, which we already mentioned. Uh, you don't have to read panic, which I also mentioned. And okay, so another thing for, for those that haven't seen panic or, or <coughs> use this sort of thing, uh, panic doesn't kill defer. So any defer stack that you have, it will unravel it. It doesn't have to be uh, the first defer, it doesn't have to be the last defer, it, it doesn't matter. It's a, a stack for those not familiar. If you make multiple defers, <coughs> it's a first in, first, first in, last out stack. Um, so all your resource cleanup and other stuff you would normally do in defer still happens. You don't lose any of that sexiness. That's all I have. So unless that's a very neat trick. Thanks for sharing. <laughs>